and coming down the stairs to the basement, my friend Robin Rigglesworth is here. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Joe? Well, I'm 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 fascinated by your work, my friend, and I've dug into it the last few weeks, and I'm excited to share some of just a few of the many, many, many stories that you have here in Trillions with uh, stackers. But look, can we talk about you personally for a second? How did you get interested in this topic at all? What made you decide to to, to go deep on the index fund? Well, it started off with, you know, over a decade and a half ago, I was actually a Middle East correspondent at the FT. And at the time, the, the Gulf countries were desperately trying to develop their financial markets and were trying to launch this weird thing called ETFs. And this was 2009. I thought ETFs, that sounds a little bit like CDO and things like that, right? The financial <laughs> right. crisis had just happened. So I went to this meeting just to learn a little bit. And I vaguely knew what an index fund was. And ETFs are basically sort of a new form of index funds. And uh, there was a lady there called Debbie Fur, who's been this sort of, a, the, sort of John the Baptist of, of index funds around the world. And she really just kind of opened my eyes to it, both the, the pros and just saying, look, this is going to become a trillion dollar industry. I was like, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that was like, we're talking it was two, three hundred billion then at the time. And I thought that was pretty big. You That's know, what I was going to say. At the time, at the industry. Well, well, yeah, at the time, Robin, it's it, it's funny how quickly ETFs grew because 2009, not that long ago. I mean, the big scheme of things, that's yesterday. Exactly. No, I mean, I, I, I thought she was, you know, going crazy in the heat in the Gulf, right? I mean, it's warm <laughs> down there. Trillion dollars. That's insane. Uh, but no, I mean, she she was bang on with uh, the, the time it would hit it. And I think, you know, nobody would have expected and this is, you know, seven, eight trillion dollars now globally. So yeah, yeah. It's astonishing. So since then, I've just been interested. And the more and more, when I started digging into the history of it, because I do love history, I just realized there were these really interesting, zany characters. And you kind of have to be to be a disruptor. And I just want to write a story about them. Let's let's dive in then. You You start off back in the 1800s with a Frenchman who can't keep a job. Nobody, everybody seems to overlook this guy. And you start with him. Tell me who the man is and, and why you trace index funds really back to him. Well, so Louis Bacalier uh, is a classic one of those guys that nobody outside of finance, and quite a lot of people in finance don't know who he is, but he's sort of a giant of mathematical uh, finance financial economics. He's considered the father of financial economics. So he was a, a mathematician, really gifted mathematician, uh, who had this really checkered life. You know, his, his parents died suddenly when he was young. So he had to bought plans to study at the Sorbonne to run his father's uh, Vintner business and take care of his younger sister. Then he was finally going back to the Sorbonne to study. And then World War, uh, the, the war broke out between France and Prussia. So he got enlisted in that. Then he finally made it to the Sorbonne to study uh, math, math, mathematics under people like Henri Poincaré. And, you know, the Sorbonne is sort of the really center of mathematics in Europe, and arguably the world at the time. Sure. And he was a brilliant student. But he did a part-time job because he wasn't rich like most of the other students. He started to support himself. So he did a job at the French Stock Exchange and thought it was really interesting. And he thought he'd write about like how the prices of financial security seemed to move around. And he wrote his PhD thesis on this. So everybody thought, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. The maths are pretty interesting. Like he, he did equations to calculate the probability and showed how stocks seemed to move pretty randomly. But he didn't get a great grade. He didn't get the top grade because people thought finance was a bit grubby at the time. Like, <laughs> serious mathematicians don't write about finance. I mean, get out of here. So they gave him an OK grade, which wasn't enough for him to actually get a professorship. So he bounced between jobs and the French army for the rest of his life until he died in obscurity. But you also write, he, you also write, by the way, that, that part of it seems like his issue was, I mean, it sounds like there was no flair to his paper either. He was, it was deep mathematics. A lot of people barely understood what the hell he was even talking about. And he didn't really, it, it sounded like he didn't really care to, you know, a, a put window dressing on it at all for the rest of us. No, for he certainly didn't have me in mind when he was writing that paper. Sadly. <laughs> so it was a bit of a slog, like a lot of mathematics papers. It's very much it was written for his tutors and nobody really else. Uh, but it became the wellspring from which people started to realize that 
stocks kind of moved randomly. And he's only discovered by random uh, by a, a, a famous American statistician. I think he was involved in the Manhattan Project at some point. And he was nearly blind, but he randomly stumbled over his uh, PhD thesis whilst he was going through uh, the uh, his university library. And he was friends with a very famous economist called Paul Samuelson. And Paul Samuelson was like the, the granddaddy of American economics. His, his, his you know, textbooks are still being read today. So, you know, uh, Savage, Jimmy Savage, uh, sent this postcard to his friend, Paul Samuelson, and said, have you heard of this dude? And Paul Samuelson said, no, but this is incredible. And he spread the knowledge of Louis Bacalier. And in afterwards, that is the genesis of what is known as the random walk of stock market prices. So Bacalier talks about that, but then we have to start tracking things. And really, you trace a lot of tracking, I believe, to a Alfred Cowles III. Yeah. So, I mean, I always think of this as two streams. Like One was like the realization that most investment, professional investment managers do a mediocre to bad job. And then a, a theory for why that is. So Louis Bacalier is sort of the granddaddy of, sort of the efficient markets hypothesis that you know, Gene Farmer built on, that he took the random walk and built into fully fledged theory of financial markets and markets in general. Uh, Alfred Cowles was one of the first people in the world, as far as I can see, that actually quantitatively studied how well professionals did at investing. So you got the annual reports of various fire insurance uh, uh, companies and stock picking letters whilst he was tuberculosis ridden. So he was the heir of the, of the big Chicago fortune, but he got tuberculosis, had to recuperate and started doing this almost for fun. He loved measuring stuff. He loved measuring weather, the length of sharks, uh, brown eyes, blue eyes, everything. And he just happened to be obsessed with stock market prices. So he did the first study that showed that actually professionals do a pretty bad job. Yeah, and and it was it was funny even during that time that he's that he's uh, measuring and writing, and he's finding out that pros do a bad job. People are railing on fees. Then, Robin, you point out at that point, uh, b b one great one great book that you mentioned uh, in 1940 was called something like written by a former stockbroker was called something like where are the customers yachts? Yeah. Like all the stockbrokers got yachts. What, what customers have yachts? Well, there's a reason why that book is still a classic, right? I mean, I, I have it here in my oh, library. Do you? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 still, first of all, it's very funnily written as well. And that phrase, where the customer's yachts, is still you know incredibly relevant. But yeah, so that was after the Great Depression when Cowles also did his study. So, you know, in the roaring 20s, who cared like whether your fund manager did as well as the market? Because first, you were making so much money anyway, you didn't care. And second, people didn't know what the overall market was really doing. So you had things like the Dow Jones Industrial Average that was being compiled every day, but nobody knew how well it done over time. So it just seems it just seems yeah. it, it seems weird that nobody nobody had tracked how the Dow Jones as long as the Dow Jones had been late eighteen hundreds, right? The Dow Jones, uh, but nobody really kept track of how over years it had done. Well, the Dow Jones to a certain extent, but it only captured you know, 30 stocks and mostly sure. transport stocks. So, and it's yeah. also, it's a slightly odd index. It's, it's weighted by the value of the stock, like just the dollar price of it rather than the value of the company. Uh, so there were other better indices starting to emerge, but broadly speaking, no. I mean, Merrill Lynch, after in the 50s and 60s, desperately wanted to start uh, marketing stocks to investors. And they were going to say stocks are a great long-term investment. And the Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. financial watchdog, said, no, hang on, you can't do that. <laughs> Easy. You have to prove that stocks are a good investment. So Merrill Lynch, basically, in desperation, hired a University of Chicago professor to say, look, here's a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Go and figure out what stocks have returned in the long run. And that was Jim Laurie. And he did what was the granddaddy study of this. I want to ask you about Lori in a second, but I want to stop right there for a second, Robin, because uh, everybody hanging out with us, listening to this, you know, we have these, we have these biases today that one thing is better than something else. And there were a bunch of biases back then that you point out at, which are that bonds, everybody believes because nobody's tracking it, have a higher return plus bonds are safer. But the part that made me laugh out loud, Robin, when I'm reading your work is 
People thought they were easier to understand. It's yeah. what, and now today, nobody can understand a bond. We have no idea what the hell, how the hell it works. But stocks seem like the easiest thing ever for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like every bond, like every single bond is basically a unique snowflake. Uh, but stocks, you know, they're kind of interchangeable. Like IBM has one stock out there, but God knows how many bonds and debt securities it has out there. But back in the day, bonds, and this don't forget, this was a generation scarred by the biggest financial crisis in history at the time, the Great Depression. And obviously in that time, you know, some people would have lost money on some bonds, but broadly speaking, bonds would have done way better than stocks. So we all suffer from these recency biases. And we think now think that obviously stocks are the best thing ever and they always only go up. Uh, whilst, you know, somebody who grew up in Russia in the 1900s would, you know, say, well, stocks went up until, you know, 1917 then, and they didn't really go anywhere for the next 100 years in the Soviet Union. So, yeah, I, I, it is the history of this is fascinating. And you kind of see sometimes echoes of present day manias or, or biases all the time. And it makes you a little bit humble about what we know and how much we know. It truly does. So back to Lori's work, really the first guy who did comprehensive tracking. And, and and let me make sure I've got this right. Really, it was Merrill Lynch going to the University of Chicago with a bunch of money saying, we want somebody to prove that stocks are a good investment. Yeah, exactly. And they thought it would take, I think Lori first promised it would take a few months and cost $100,000. And in the end, it took them four years. Uh, the problem is like when we say stock, Actually, like back in the day, there was no agreement of what was a stock. Lots of stuff, stuff that was called a stock was actually a bond or common equity versus some preferred equity was actually not preferred at all. So you, they had to sort out all this manual data from you know, decades, almost a century worth of newspaper clippings sometimes. Like nobody collected this comprehensively. So in the end, this magnetic spool that they compile the data on stretch out for miles. But the, the, the results were just fabulous. And that is really like, this is the genesis moment of index funds, because that was the data, the wellspring that almost everything flowed. The idea that actually the average investor in the stock market actually does do well. The study showed exactly what Merrill Lynch wanted it to show. It showed that in the long run, stocks actually do really well. And even if you'd invested at the peak or the roaring 20s, just before the big crash and the Great Depression, you still would have made you know, way more money than you would in bonds. But also, and this was something that Laurie thought was hilarious, uh, it also showed that the market did better than most investors. And this was the first rigorous, thorough study that showed it. Like, Cal's had done some stuff, but like, he wasn't a trained statistician. This was irrefutable evidence that most professional fund managers did worse than the overall market. How come how come nobody had ever tried to make an index out of the Dow Jones, even as flawed as you mentioned earlier, Robin, that it was? Or had somebody tried to make an index earlier on? Well, there was lots of talk that, you know, when somebody says, you know, or oh, you didn't beat your benchmark last year, um, then people say, well, you can't buy the benchmark anyway. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, but also, don't forget, people just didn't know. Just the idea of like having a fund manager at benchmark. You didn't know the most people would invest money with like say a Fidelity or a Capital Group or a Louis Dreyfus, and they'd make 5%, 20%, 9%. They just didn't know what the overall market did. Uh, and certainly in the 60s, when a lot of this stuff was happening, the 60s was a massive bull run. It was the first dot-com bubble in many ways. It was called the Nifty 50, but these like Xerox, really hot tech stocks, IBM, this up and coming hot stock called IBM at the time. So fund managers piled into those. They did incredibly well. So just even when the data came out, people said, well, sure, man, that's a great story. But like my guy at Fidelity just returned 50% this year. So I'm laughing all the way to the bank. People just didn't care. It wasn't until the bear market, the, the end of the go-go years in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s that people really started to revisit some of the stuff that's that's interesting how it takes a down mark people losing money all of a sudden we start getting analytical we're, yeah, we're, it sharpens the mind yeah absolutely uh on that note portfolio construction at the same time you write but is becoming a big thing and and on the bleeding edge of that is a gentleman named uh, harry markowitz yeah. uh, uh tell me the markowitz story <laughs> 
Well, he was really interesting. He was like a philosophy loving, geeky kid from Chicago that sort of ambled into economics purely because he found philosophy interesting and was pretty good at maths. Um, and he wrote, uh, he was going to do his PhD in economics and he just kind of ambled into that. And he had no clue what on earth to write about. He was going to his tutor to some tear his hair out, which he still had at the time, about what to write. And he, in the room outside, whilst he was waiting to see his tutor, he actually ran into a stockbroker whose name, you know, has unfortunately escaped history. But, you know, he serendipitous meeting. He said, hey, young man, you should write about stocks. Stocks are really interesting. And Harry Markowitz had no clue. But as it happened, his tutor was the head of the Cowles Commission, which Alfred Cowles has set up many decades earlier. So his tutor said to Harry Markowitz, you know, Alfred Cowles was actually kind of interested in his stocks as well. You should do something on that. But I know nothing about it. Here's a reading list. You've got to do this yourself. So Harry Markowitz went to the university library, dug out a few books, and basically suddenly had this idea when he was reading about various sort of theories of investment that actually you should optimize uh, your return for your risk. And obviously people kind of intuitively understood that. But he was a guy that took volatility, he thought, well, risk is kind of hard to measure. But the volatility, how much something moves up and down, that's a mathematical idea. You can measure that and use that as a proxy for risk. And then that way you can basically optimize risk versus you, the volatility versus uh, the risk, uh, the volatility or the risk versus the returns. And also he realized and showed mathematically the more stuff you put in there, as long as it moves independently, the overall risk of a portfolio drops. So if you buy, let's say, 10 stocks, but they all move exactly the same thing, the volatility goes to one. But if they all move pretty independently, then actually the overall volatility of the overall portfolio as a whole actually drops. So that way you can actually get a broader, higher returning, low volatility portfolio in theory. This, th this idea, I feel like, is still still today lost on so many investors that you should pay attention to the entire portfolio versus, and I'm doing the efficient front two with my hand, by the way, with people yeah. people not able to watch this audio yeah. podcast that I'm doing the, the Harry Markowitz efficient frontier, but the, uh, but, but, but it's lost on people still today that we should look at the whole aggregate versus this one thing. No, it, 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 it's kind of intuitive, but most people, you know, they want to live interesting lives. And buying a portfolio of 5,000 stocks or 500 stocks it isn't that interesting. Or, yeah. you know, mixing bonds with equities or, or real estate and so on. So we don't think in that way, even though we intuitively understand that putting all your eggs in one basket is risky. Um, and Marquis, I mean, don't forget, even at the time, the math was pretty kind of recondite. You, the computers that could actually do the calculations he was describing almost didn't exist. The only people that had those computers were the US government. They use it to model nuclear weapons. So it was entirely theoretical. I mean, Harry Markowitz almost didn't get his PhD. I thought that was, was amazing. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was uh, Milton Friedman, who was a, the granddaddy economist at the time at the University of Chicago's economics department, said, look, Harry, you know, it's, the maths look great, but this isn't economics. I can't give you a PhD in economics for something that's just like cool maths. But in the end, he did get his PhD, and actually that did win him a Nobel Prize eventually as well. Following in his footsteps, then, we have uh, we have William Sharp, and we have a gentleman named Eugene Fama. Um, and, and I'm wondering about proximity here as you're explaining these people, because they all, my understanding is these people all really knew each other um, uh, uh, and work sometimes in tandem. And we talked to an, an, uh, an expert in the area of business meets artistry who talks about great art is built on the backbone of other great artists. So it's, it's no mistaking Robin that, you know, great art comes from this one community of artists because they're all kind of working off of each other's strengths. Is that kind of what's happening here with Markowitz, Sharp, Fama, many of the others? Very much so. It's a great way of looking at it. I, I think it was Isaac Newton that once said that if I've seen further than others, it is only because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And that's very much what has happened in economics. So unfortunately, for a, for a writer like me, piecing together a clean narrative 
it's always a little bit messy, right? Sure. Like human relations doesn't work that well, but you can, like all of these people knew each other and were inspired by each other. And you know, Harry Markowitz was a mentor to Bill Sharp. Bill Sharp was actually the guy that kind of built on Harry Markowitz's work, simplified it and, and turned it into sort of a, something that could be a cogent index fund theory as it were, and earn them both uh, a PhD. So I mean, if you talk to Bill Sharp and Harry Markowitz, both of them will say, I would, neither of us would have gotten a Nobel prize without the work of the other one. They work directly. So they were all, and they definitely know Gene Farmer, uh, but they work in different universities. And this is obviously the pre-internet days. So information flowed more slowly and the collaboration was just a little bit trickier, but they definitely knew and inspired each other. And Gene Farmer, for example, one of the teachers he had at Chicago when he was a student was a, a French mathematician um, uh, called, um, uh, okay, uh, and Gene Farmer, starting again, Gene Farmer had a teacher at University of Chicago called Benoit Mandelbrot, who was this really eclectic, nomadic French-American mathematician, and Benoit Mandelbrot happened to have actually known and been intimately familiar with Louis Bekele's work. So he was the one that introduced Bekele to Gene Farmer. And Gene Farmer built that into the efficient markets theory. So all these things coming together, all these intellectual stepping stones took us to the, the promised land, as it were. So we have this background of Laurie's work and looking at tracking. We have uh, uh, the, these brilliant mathematicians uh, who, uh, uh, once we get to, to, to FAMA, now we have this unified idea that having a portfolio makes a lot of sense. Clearly, the stage is set now for the index fund, right? We now have, we now have the, the, the index fund. Um, the, the theory was there. Yeah, I mean, so Bill Sharp talked about what he never called it some an index fund. He called it the market portfolio. The idea that the perfect representation, the perfect trade-off of all risk and all return was the market portfolio, the entire market. Now, in practice, he meant everything, like stocks, bonds, real estate, the whole jamboree. Uh, but the theory, as you say, it was already there. But, you know, the finance industry, they didn't read e e economic papers coming out of <laughs> Chicago and Stanford and, and Harvard. I mean... They were making way too much money in the 60s to care about like ivory tower academics. So this didn't really kind of start filtering through except a few third tier financial institutions into sort of Wall Street's backwaters as it were. So, you know, Wells Fargo in San Francisco, American National Bank, sort of a second tier bank in Chicago, and this kind of crazy engineering, financial engineering institute in, in, in Boston called Battery March. They thought some of these ideas were pretty cool. And they attended Jim Laurie's regular sessions that kind of disseminated this research. But they, none of them were able to actually get buy-in for anybody to actually implement this until the early 70s. It's interesting from where I sit that that it is a national pastime here in the United States to to talk about how much we hate Wells Fargo, Robin. <laughs> it is a pastime. And you're saying that Wells Fargo is one of the early creators of the index fund. I'd say, actually, despite its current public image, that Wells Fargo was for a fairly long period or inspired some of the, the most innovative investment practices the world has ever seen. And a lot uh, of those people, by the way, led to really innovation around the index funds, which now really you have to point to dimensional funds, right? You have to point to where, where FAMA is today. Exactly. So, so Wells Fargo is sort of the wellspring where a lot of this came out of both index funds, but also quantitative investing, I'd argue, was, was arguably born there. And it's all because of one guy called John Mac McCrown, who was a frustrated Solomon banker. Uh, he was an investment banker, but kind of hated investment banking, even though he liked finance. But he loved computers. He was a computer nerd at a time when you know the word nerd didn't really exist. And he, on the side of his day job, kind of tried to see if stock market prices could be predicted with computers at a big IBM mainframe in New York. Never got anywhere, but the IBM people there thought it was so weird what he was doing. They wanted to show off like all the alternative uses for computers. They thought maybe finance could use computers as well. So they paid for him to give a seminar on all the work he was doing 
over in San Diego. And in the audience happened to be the, the chief executive and chairman of Wells Fargo. And he hired Mac basically on the spot, said, look, we must be able to do better. We must be able to do some stuff with computers that we can't do today. So here is a massive, essentially unlimited budget. Go out, hire people, do cool shit, and come back with what you find. And by the way, the early index funds you write, low fee from the beginning, very low yeah. fee from the beginning. I mean, high fee compared to today's index fund. But yes, the, sure. the idea knew that this was never going to be sold as anything other than a cheap, low cost product, even though, you know, statistically, index funds still beat the most average active managers. It, OK, if I've done my job well here, Robin, I've got over half of my audience now yelling at their device because <laughs> there is there is a name that we have not mentioned in this entire thing. There's a name we have not mentioned. And I want to take you back to 1960. There is a paper that's written by a by a gentleman calling himself. Uh, uh, I'm looking for the name. Armstrong was his last name. Um, uh, tell me about this paper. Well, so a, a few months earlier, some a California professor, economics professor called uh, Renshaw, had written a paper saying, look, there's so many mutual funds there, it's hard to choose. Maybe somebody should come up with something like the market portfolio, just basically that buys the entire stock market. Basically, the first index fund. This is the first articulation of an index fund, even though it didn't really take it all the way. And this uh, pseudonymous John B. Armstrong just thought that was ridiculous. How dare some ivory tower economist suggest an index fund? Because obviously, as the data he had showed, most active managers beat the market. Now, obviously, the twist is that that John B. Armstrong was a pen name for Jack Bogle. And he was, a, he was a senior guy at Wellington then. He was an ardent believer in active management. He was a hotshot of the asset management industry. And he could see this would be a massive threat so he roundly ridiculed it, albeit under a pen name. He gets so much credit today by investors for being the, the father of the index fund, right? Your book says that while he's heavily involved, and by the way, and, and, and he built a great career on lowering fees and on indexes, um, along with active management, that uh, that he he didn't start it. Where was he at during all of the beginning of the index fund? What was he working on? Well, he was a senior executive of Wellington, uh, working as an assistant, senior vice president, the, the heir apparent there. So he was like one of the youngest guys in the industry, complete wonder kind. And, and he, you know, took it over eventually, right? But in the 60s, Wellington was mostly famous for having balanced conservative funds and balanced and conservative funds weren't sexy in the 60s. So Bogle was given a remit to reinvigorate the company. It was hand of the reins, you do this. And he merged Wellington with one of the hotshot go-go fund managers of the 60s in, in Boston. Now, unfortunately, when the go-go era ended, basically all those funds did abysmally, including Wellington's, and they had a massive falling out between Bogle and his former partners, the Boston partners. Now, unfortunately, Bogle had ceded so much control of Wellington when he did this, when he did the merger, that they were able to gang up and fire him rather than him firing them. Mm -hmm. And he did this kind of Hail Mary um, sort of corporate gambit, really. I mean, it really was Hail Mary. But in the US, each fund obviously has an independent board. In practice, most funds' independent boards aren't that independent of the actual investment manager. But he was able to go to them after being sacked by Wellington's board. He went to the Wellington fund boards and said, look, you don't have to sack me. You should declare independence. And that was a bridge too far. But essentially what they did was set up an administrative company that would just do all the paperwork for the Wellington funds. And Jack Bogle would be given that job and he'd have the same salary as he did as the CEO of Wellington, which was, I think, $100,000 at the time, quite a lot of money. But it was, you know, this was a consolation prize. This was a thanks, but, you know, you can't stay kind of thing. But he turned that administrative outfit into Vanguard, this $8 trillion industry uh, eight trillion assets under management company now. 
You but, write that he truly was a force of nature. Like he was, it was difficult to be in the room with him. You said he wouldn't back down from an argument. He was very, very uh, charismatic. Hugely. I mean, I definitely think that he should get an enormous amount of the credit for the growth of indexing and just journey to fee pressures across the board. Certainly in the how US did he market. change? But how did he change his mind though? So if he's if he's Mr. Active in, in 1960, where was the big, you know, the light shines down and the heavens open up and he hears the angels sing? <laughs> well, I mean, he he was always fond of, of, of quoting Keynes that when the facts change, I change my mind. I, I think in reality, it was just his 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 corporate jihad against the partners that fired him at Wellington. So his remit at Vanguard, which was obviously a pretty glamorous name to give a company that was doing paperwork, meant that he couldn't do investment management, but he needed to do something. He wanted to get back at them. And then he happened to read Paul Samuelson, whose textbook he'd read when he was at Princeton, talking about you know these new index funds started by Wells Fargo. Somebody should do this for ordinary investors. And he said, yes, that is something that, first of all, Samuelson wants us to do it, so that's a pretty good endorsement, but also something we could plausibly do because there's no management involved. It's unmanaged. So obviously this is a little bit of artful deceit, but basically he went to the board of the Wellington Funds and Vanguard and said, look, we want to do this. It's cheap. We won't have to do distribution. We'll get some banks to do that for us because they weren't allowed to do distribution either. And it's unmanaged, so it doesn't breach our mandate. And they said... All, all right, then, you go do this. And it was an abysmal failure, of course. Absolute disaster. They went from thinking they could raise $150 million, a decent amount of money at the time. They might raise $11 million. I mean, no ordinary investor wanted to buy that. I mean, it was crazy. So, yeah, it was an abysmal failure. It's, it's so interesting. And this is just... This is just the icing on the story. You've got so many stories. If 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 you were U.S. based, I would think that part of your promotion would be to create like we have baseball cards here, you know, with all these people, and have have the Markowitz baseball card, the Bogle baseball card, the Lori baseball card. Like that would be a brilliant marketing piece for this book because there's there's so many names and so many people and their stories and the way they you weave them in is just phenomenal. The book is called Trillions: uh, How a Band of Wall Street Renegades Invented the index fund and change finance forever. And I'm assuming, Robin, it's available everywhere. Uh, I, I certainly hope so. And if not, then email me and I will literally physically email <laughs> some people copies with a very nice inscription. I forgot to ask you one final question, my friend. What what surprised you most as you were doing this research? Was there something that just caught you completely off guard? It's a great question. Uh, I just love the stories. I mean, I like. I mean, I, I like finance, and I think finance and investing are hugely important things. And sometimes people pretend it's more obscure and recondite than it really should be. Uh, and a way to make it understandable is to realize it's about human stories. And and, and this is a broad, familiar story, but business disruption. Some renegades invent a really disruptive new technology. The industry, the incumbents, spit upon them, but eventually they win, and they win big. So that was familiar to me. I knew that was the arc, the story arc. But for me, it was just the delightfulness of these people, right? I mean, and also many of the pioneers, some have sadly passed away. Some passed away in the middle of my research, but a lot of them were in their late eighties and still active. Like Harry Markowitz is still writing. Actively. Right. Farmer is still teaching. Mac McCrown, who invented the first index fund, is still active investor. He's still a, a board member of Dimensional Fund Advisors. So that was just hugely inspirational, talking to these people, these legends, and, and just thinking, look, if I have half their energy and half their intellect at half the age, then I'd be pretty happy.